but rather around a common orientation to the existence of the state of Israel itself. Since the idea of Zionism was raised in the second half of the 19th century, it has encountered political, philosophical, and pragmatic opponents. The debate raged amongst Jews. Some argued that Jews should embrace a national liberation strategy to respond to European anti-Semitism. Others argued that Jews should throw their weight behind liberal and socialist universalizing movements in Europe and through them fight for a society in which all people could live in peace with mutual respect. But these pre-Second World War anti-Zionist movements are not the focus here. I'm interested in the set of post-war movements that understood themselves to follow in this tradition, but that lived in a radically changed world. A world in which the Holocaust had happened, and a world in which Zionism had been transformed from a utopian idea into an existing state. It is largely the way contemporary anti-Zionism relates to this different world that defines it as a movement. It understands its opposition to Israel's existence as a battle of ideas against an idea. Its first focus is always on Zionism as an ideology. Its relationship to real-world phenomena is conditioned by its explanatory emphasis on ideology. Israel, therefore, is not understood as a state by anti-Zionists living in a world of states, and Israelis are not thought of as a nation living in a world of nations. It is because the idea is thought to be illegitimate or racist that the state and the nation themselves can be thought of as such. Anti-Zionism relates to an existent social reality as though it were a bad idea. If only it dreams it was possible to go back to the pre-war debate and this time to win it. Yet the decisive factor in the outcome of the pre-war debate was the Holocaust, not the rights and wrongs of the argument. It is the Holocaust that needs to be undone to prevent Israel coming into existence. But this fact is not recognised by the anti-Zionist movement. The Holocaust is often discussed by anti-Zionists. It is understood as something that is used by Zionists to justify their racist actions. It is understood as an event that, if not authored by the Zionists themselves, was aided by them. The Holocaust is understood as a source of illegitimate power and moral authority that covers the crimes of Zionism. The Holocaust is understood as the trauma that psychoanalytically pathologizes Israel. But the Holocaust is never understood as a set of events that materially transformed the existence of European Jewry and thus created the conditions that made it possible for Jewish nationalists to transform Zionism from an idea into a state. Post-1948 anti-Zionism is not a single movement but a collection of differing currents. There is a current of Middle Eastern anti-Zionism that has been hostile first to Jewish immigration into Palestine and then to the foundation and continued existence of Israel. In the Middle East, there are both secular and Islamic anti-Zionist traditions. In the Soviet Union, in the Eastern Bloc, there was a tradition of Stalinist anti-Zionism. Right-wing and neo-Nazi anti-Semitism is increasingly articulating its hostility to Jews in the form of anti-Zionist rhetoric. There is also a contemporary current of openly anti-Semitic anti-Zionism, that is hard to place in terms of the left-right scale. It's difficult to define which movements and which ideas belong in some way authentically to the left. The difficulty of maintaining a focus on left anti-Zionism is compounded by the fact that much of the anti-Zionist rhetoric from the left is now being adopted by movements clearly outside of the left. Much of the left after the Holocaust supported the foundation of Israel wanting to back the underdog against anti-Semitism and against British imperialism. But after 67 and the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, anti-Zionist discourses grew to become significant on the left. In order to approach a clear analysis of this contemporary anti-Zionism, it is necessary to do more 
than look at arguments and narratives that it produces. It is also necessary to look at how the concepts and actualities of the social movement interact. In this arena particularly, ideas do not exist in isolation. They're part of a movement. And the anti-Zionist movement has extremely unclear, porous and shifting boundaries. The debate exists at the intersection of a number of different and mutually hostile terrains. The left discourses of anti-imperialism and post-colonial theory, the totalitarian discourses inspired by Nazism, jihadi fundamentalism and Stalinist communism, the nationalist discourses of Arab and Palestinian anti-colonialism, the religious discourses of anti-Semitism, and also Jewish communal minority anti-Zionist movement. Concepts and common sense notions developed within one kind of discourse tend to slip and slide and metamorphose into those other terrains. Some elements of the broad anti-Zionist movement are self-consciously anti-Semitic, that is racist against Jews. It is necessary to analyse the way that elements that think of themselves as anti-racist relate ideologically with these other traditions. Social movements aim to create a new common sense or hegemonic notion, concepts and ways of thinking around which political alliances are formed. It's necessary to look at how concepts act on the social movements which take them up and how they migrate and develop in the actuality of these movements. One of the premises of the anti-Zionist movement is that Zionism is not a form of nationalism. Nationalism is usually understood to contain racist pot potentialities, as well as elements that define a community of common responsibility. Rather, Zionism is defined as being essentially different from all other nationalisms, as nothing but a form of racism. It's necessary to investigate the truth of this claim, as well as the coherence of the argument. But this will only uncover half of the story. The other half is to be understood by looking at the ways that the Zionism equals racism claim is actualised in the movement and in the world beyond. How does the anti-Zionist movement actually relate to Zionists who are defined as racists? How does it licence others to relate to Zionists? How does it in practice define the group Zionists? This left anti-Zionist current is hostile to Zionists, but not to Jews that are anti-Zionist. Or it's hostile to Zionism, but not to the Zionists. Or it hates the sin and it loves the sinner. This is its general defence against charges of anti-Semitism. It takes little re political responsibility for the possibility that its teachings and its actions <coughs> might be understood as a license for an anti-Semitic politics. It accepts little political responsibility for the possibility that it may act as a midwife to openly anti-Semitic movements. The anti-Zionist movement understands the distinction between state and civil society in Israel to be entirely absent. The anti-Zionists typically don't understand Israel as a state, they rely on a reading of civic nationalism that defines a state as a set of political institutions that have sovereignty within a territory and that endow the people who live there with citizenship. Israel is not a state then, but is more like Hannah Arendt's account of a totalitarian movement. Its membership defined by blood, its boundaries open to unlimited expansion, its institutions the property of one predefined group. In this way, the normal distinction between state and civil society is dissolved. The idea of a unity of a people with a state sets up a frame for doing criticism that dissolves all politically relevant distinctions. Anti-Zionism fuses civil society and the state. It makes no distinction between people in their plurality and state policy, 
And it's also often tempted to dissolve the distinction between civilian and soldier. Zionism is typically presented by, in anti-Zionist discourse as a one-dimensional unity. There is a rejection of a methodology that is interested in development over time, or in understanding the phenomenon in context, or of understanding the complex and contra contradictory dynamics that are usually thought to characterise the development of a movement or a state. Distinctions between left and right, bigots and anti-racists, one form or tradition of Zionism and another, settlers and non-settlers, occupied territories and Israel, Arab citizens and Arab non-citizens are all drowned out. The distinction that dominates is between Zionist and anti-Zionist. Everything else is insignificant. <coughs> Typically, anti-Zionists will respond to this charge by saying that it is not the anti-Zionists that blur distinctions, but the Zionists. It is Israel, they would say, that has no separation between state and civil society. It is Israel that wants to annex the West Bank. It is Israel that subordinates politics to the imperatives of security. It is Israel that singles itself out in the world, they say. This is an illustration of the way that anti-Zionism tends to replicate in its critique the errors and crimes of inverted commas Zionism. Zionism here is in inverted commas because it is not actual Zionism or the actual practices of Israel that the anti-Zionists replicate but rather, it is their own construction of Zionism, which bears little resemblance to the material reality of the State of Israel. Their Zionism is a totalitarian movement that is equivalent to racism, Nazism, apartheid. Anti-Zionism de defines itself against a notion of Zionism that is constructed by its own discourse and its own narratives. Joseph Massad is a theorist whose work embodies all of the central features that I identify as being typical of the anti-Zionist movement. His paper, The Ends of Zionism, Racism and the Palestinian Struggle, is a summation of his argument for supporting, quote, the continuing resistance of Palestinians to all civil and military institutions that uphold Jewish supremacy and campaigning for, quote, divestment from Israel, imposing an international economic blockade on that country, cultural and tourism boycotts, and instituting an international diplomatic isolation of the country. He begins with the assertion that Zionism is a colonial movement that is constituted in ideolo ideology and practice by a religio-racial epistemology, adding that it is important also to analyse the racial dimension of Zionism in its current manifestation. He understands Zionism to de be defined by its commitment to building a democratic, demographically exclusive Jewish state, which he understands along, alongside the European colonial ideology of white supremacy over colonised people. Already, we can see that Massad's notion of Zionism is essentially monolithic. It is one Jewish supremacist movement from the 1880s to the present day. There are no significant differences between Zionism in the 19th and the 21st century, between left and right, between religious and secular, between labour and fundamentalist Jewish Zionism. Massad writes as though the project to create a single Israeli culture with a single ideology, a single purpose, the homogenous body of Israeli Jews has been successful. All differences are flattened out by the dominating principle of Jewish supremacism. This assumption of homogeneity underpins a methodology of taking incidents and quotations from particular people, places and times to stand for and illustrate the true nature of all Zionists in all places throughout history. His anti-Zionist methodology starts with Zionist ideology. 
And this task is much simplified by the assumption of homogeneity. This assumption is justified by reference to two things in Massad's work. Firstly, Zionism is understood as part of the European colonial project. This expands the methodology of explanatory flattening globally and across 500 years. The whole history of white imperialism is understood as essentially one racist project. The Crusades, British rule in India, colonisation of Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, South Africa, the British mandate in Palestine, American policy during the Cold War, in South and Central America and East Asia, the wars against the Saddam regime in Iraq, Belgium rule in Congo, all are essentially the same. All difference is insignificant next to the one explanatory element of European racist exploitation. <coughs> and Israel is part of this wider project. Actual history, human agency and contingency constitute little but the way that the big project happens to have played itself out at different times in different places. <coughs> and the Jewish supremacist project for Massad is not a racist movement among Jews. I don't know if people can see this because they're on the screen properly. Massad says the only way these arguments acquire any purchase is in the context of an international read Western commitment to Jewish supremacy. Wherein Jews are seen as white Europeans defending white European values and civilization against the primitive Arab hordes. So Jews are not just Jews and Israel is not just a state. Zionists and Israel constitute for Mossad one central element of the larger Western imperialist project. Some 19th century, inverted commas, socialists constructed Jews as being a central element to the workings of international capital. <coughs> Contemporary anti-Zionism understands the Jewish state to play a pivotal role in global imperialism. And I think that there's an analogy between the two arguments. The second element that justifies the assumption of Zionist homogeneity is definition. What various Zionists have said and written is interpreted as coherent and unified agreement upon an essentially racist project. Zionism is defined by Massad as Jewish supremacism. It is related to racist movements, to Nazism, to colonial projects, to apartheid. The essential, necessary and unchangeable character of Israel is defined not by sociology, not by looking at Israel and what it does and what it has done, but by definition. Actuality <coughs> is always found to be a manifestation of this definitional necessity. One key way of defining the difference between anti-Zionism in the sense that I'm using it here and straightforward criticism of Israeli, of Israeli policy is that anti-Zionism insists that Israel is not a state like other states, and Israeli nationalism is not a nationalism like other nationalisms. Zionism is Nazism, but Israel is not like Germany. Zionism carries out ethnic cleansing, but Israel is not like Croatia or Serbia. Zionism settles occupied land, but Israel is not like China. Zionism is a colonial settler project, but Israel is not like Australia. For anti-Zionism, Israel is the movement, not a state. Its policy is always a manifestation of its inner essence, and its inner essence is derived by definitional wordplay. This framework gives a huge explanatory importance to ideas and ideology. <coughs> the racist idea is held to create and define the necessarily racist reality. The story is often told by anti-Zionists. It begins with Herzl, it picks out some racist quotes from his book, it moves to Yabotinsky and to Ben-Gurion, picking out quotes and anecdotes, before it arrives in 1948 and the Nakba, as the actualization of the racist idea in the world. 
It goes on to 67 and shows how the inherently expansionist and colonial character of the Zionist idea is manifested by the taking and settling of territory. There's an old joke that somebody told me from the 1920s. What's the definition of a Zionist? A Zionist is one Jew who gives money to a second Jew so that a third Jew can go and live in Palestine. Contemporary anti-Zionism understands itself to be in the tradition of pre-war opposition to the project of Zionism, but it misses what happened in between. What happened was that the perspectives of the European Jewish anti-Zionists were not only politically defeated by Nazism, but most of the anti-Zionists were also killed by Nazis. Jewish life and culture over large parts of Europe was removed, and it was not difficult to understand why amongst the remnants that remained, the attraction of Israel was strong. Israel was not imagined as a European colony. The idea that Jews in the refugee camps in Europe and in British Cyprus in, say, 1947, recovering from starvation and from lives as non-humans, were thinking of themselves as standard bearers of the European idea, shows how far removed from reality is much anti-Zionist discourse. It was not the ideas of Herzl and Jabotinsky that led to the War of 48. It was the Holocaust. Jews did not go to Palestine to get rich on the back of the natives. They went there because Europe spat them out. Jews did not embody some idea of European whiteness. They embodied a European idea of rats and cockroaches that constituted an existential threat. <clears throat> Isaac Deutscher, someone who had lived his early political life in the Yiddish-speaking milieu of the Jewish left in Europe, before the Holocaust, wrote the following in 1954. <laughs> it's not very legible. A man, he said, once jumped from the top floor of a burning house in which members of his family had already perished. He managed to save his life <coughs> But as he was falling, he hit a person standing down below and broke that person's legs and arms. If both behaved rationally, they would not have become enemies. But look what happens when these people behave irrationally, says Deutscher. The injured man blames the other for his misery and swears to make him pay for it. The other, afraid of the crippled man's revenge, insults him, kicks him, and beats him up whenever they meet. The bitter enmity, so fortuitous at first, hardens and, be, and comes to overshadow the whole existence of both men and to poison their minds. If we understand the establishment of the State of Israel in the context of the huge events in the middle of the 20th century, and if we understand that it has material causes as well as ideational ones, then we can see that anti-Zionism in 1929, for example, had an entirely different meaning and content to the one that it has today. In 29, it was part of a genuine, genuine, politically, genuine political dispute, primarily amongst Jews. In 2005, the debate is about different issues. How can Israeli Jews and Palestinians forge a just peace? How can the racist currents within Israel and also within Palestine be politically defeated? How can the tragic history that brought Jews and Palestinians into such bloody conflict be transcended into the future? Anti-Zionism maintains that the terms of the debate and what is at stake have not changed. Annoyingly, I rather like this quote, which is why I give it to you. Norman Finkelstein uses this quote in his new book to... It's quite interesting that he does that, because it's quite sharp of him to kind of attack what I think is the strongest argument against him, rather than attacking the weakest arguments against him. It's quite annoying, because people will think that I stole 
quote from his book. Um, there's a little bit in my paper about what Finkelstein says about it, if people have got a copy. So to conclude, left anti-Zionism is adopted by people who, that consider themselves to be Marxists and historical materialists. Strange then that it operates in a, with a methodology that gives an overwhelming explanatory importance to ideas. This methodology is selective. What it leaves out is as important as what it includes. For example, the Holocaust. For example, the ethnic cleansing of Jews from the rest of the Middle East in the 50s and 60s. For example, the existence of the anti-racist Israeli left and peace movement. For example, Middle Eastern anti-Semitism. <coughs> left anti-Zionism is often adopted by people that consider themselves to be anti-essentialist. Yet it operates with a methodology that understands events as little more than manifestations of Israel's racist, colonial and totalitarian essence. Had Ariel Sharon failed to make good on his promise to withdraw the settlers from Gaza, this would have been explained in terms of the Zionist necessity to occupy land. When in fact Sharon did withdraw the settlers, this was explained in terms of the racist logic of Zionist demographics. Any event is understood as an epiphenomenon of the Zionist essence. Left anti-Zionism is often adopted by people that consider themselves to be politically hyper-responsible. It operates in a world where virtually all anti-Semitism clothes itself in the rhetoric of anti-Zionism, Yet it fails to see this context as significant and it refuses to take reasonable care <coughs> in its consciousness of the boundaries between anti-Semitic demonization and legitimate criticism. It operates as though the only kind of anti-Zionism that is significant is itself. Left anti-Zionism is often adopted by people who consider themselves to be hostile to nationalism but it fails to build a cosmopolitan politics excuse me it fails to build a cosmopolitan politics that avoids replicating the phenomenon that is that it is fighting against anti-zionism constructs a crude caricature of zionism which it treats as though it was the truth about all jewish nationalism at all times it defines its own worldview in opposition to this self-created monolith. Real Jews and real Palestinians are replaced in the left anti-Zionist imagination by symbolic Zionists and heroic victims. Left anti-Zionism's critique of Israeli nationalism obliterates the actuality of politics within Israel and politics within Palestine. It presents a picture of reality that consists only of two opposing nationalisms between which one is forced to choose. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for a very uh, um, I was wondering if you could talk about left philosophers and their role in this, particularly Marx, uh, Foucault, Marcuse, what do, do, do these, you know, I, their I, ideologies of power and, you know, the oppressor versus the oppressed, and now that Jews have, you know, quote unquote, made it, at least in America, you know, and Jews are therefore categorized alongside wasps as being, you know, in this echelon of power, d does that play into this and that they're therefore safe to slander <coughs> Jews in a way that you can't slander blacks, women, gays, Hispanics, you know, oppressed groups? And Jews are no longer oppressed, and therefore they're, they're safe to, to, to go after. Well, I won't try to do a lecture on Marx, Foucault, and Marx, but <laughs> what I would say, if we take Marx, is that my position is that the anti-Zionists haven't read enough Marx. <laughs> it's not that they've read too much Marx, and what they've read they haven't understood. Okay? So I would argue that the... I think... In Marxist terms, I think their critique is entirely idealist. I think they claim to be big macho historical materialists, 
They claim to think through from the world <laughs> to ideas, but what they do is exactly the other way around. They start with the idea, and they understand the idea to create material reality. So they need to read more Marx. I think if you read Marx on the Jewish question, which is a very controversial piece, I think the reason it's controversial is because people don't read it right. <laughs> and I think that what Marx is doing in the Jewish question is very clear. He says uh, that um, there's an interesting quote from him. Somebody asked Marx, will you write the petition to the Diet, the local parliament, for Jewish emancipation? And Marx says, yes, I will. I don't like the conservative religious leadership of the Jewish community, but I will write the petition for Jewish emancipation. The reason, because Marx takes rights seriously. And Marx says, rights are extremely important. Rights are not the same thing as full human emancipation. But that doesn't mean we don't take rights seriously. I use Marx on the Jewish question to teach human rights to my students. And so it's, it's I mean, in terms of Foucault, in terms of post-structuralist theory, in terms of post-modernism, in terms of that kind of stuff, it's an utterly essentialist theory. Um, the idea that we can read Israel, every manifestation of Israel's badness from its racist essence. So my answer to that broadly would be, they should read more Marx, they should read more Foucault, they should read more Marcuse, and they should read it properly. So I have a question to follow up. Um, so from, from taking, can you talk about them, or speak about the tensions that exist, say, in a Marxist framework between the, the main conflict in society between the workers and the owners of the means of production, and people or groups of people that have strong identities or group identities. So there's a sort of tension in Marxism between, you know, fighting for a revolution, and it, once the revolution occurs, all these issues of anti-Semitism, racism, all these things will go away because it's part of this false consciousness. So can you speak to the tension and how Israel and Jews with a strong identity throughout history it takes on different forms and shapes, perhaps, but it's strong. How there is perhaps inherent tension between the Jewish question and Marxism. Um, and then, then, I don't know if you want to speak about, you know, I'm thinking of Gramsci and other Marxists who kind of open up Marxism to, to accept different forms of culture and you know, cultural conflicts and that sort of thing. That's one question. Uh, and the second question, if you could call it, a com if you could please comment, is that the largest group of uh, Israelis are Mizrahi Jews. And they come from, they're dispossessed from, from Arab countries that went through a period of decolonization. So how can that narrative or narratives fit into your framework? Right, okay. Um, we're looking at a huge history from Marx himself and Marx's critique of the idiot anti-Semitic ultra-leftist in the Jewish question, and Marx's critique was very straightforward, Bruno Bauer, if you say that Jewish emancipation is meaningless, then you're certainly not a Marxist if I'm a Marxist, says Marx. <laughs> that tradition, all the way through um, how to discuss the history of the left, I mean, the rise of the Russian Revolution, the rise of Stalinism, is huge. I think that within Marxist movements, and certainly within the kind of Marxist movements that we're talking about, there has been a transformation from an idea that what is central to socialism is politics, and the aspiration to say that people in all countries have something in common with each other. A cosmopolitan politics which has a critique of nationalism, which says we're not all made up of essentially different nations, but in fact we have a lot in common. And if we look at nationalism, then we find that the things that nationalists say are very often um, narratives which don't actually bear an entire relation to the truth. So what, there's this Marxist tradition that says we have more in common than we have different, if you like. And I think that that tradition has got lost 
in actually a post-Second World War um, obsession with splitting the world into two, not in terms of class, not in terms of ordinary people who work for a living on the one hand and capital on the other, but in terms of good and bad nations, and oppressed and oppressor nations. And I think that the distinction that anti-Zionists make between good Palestine and bad Israel can only make sense if you think that the central important distinction between them is that one is oppressed and the other is oppressor. And again, these categories are not localised geographically or in time, but become essentialised, so that Jews become oppressors. And as I said, the idea that Jews in Cyprus in 1947 in refugee camps were oppressors or the representative of the European racist ideas is absolutely absurd. But I think that one of the ways in which Marxism has gone after the Second World War for a number of quite interesting reasons is to trade in the idea of um, cosmopolitan politics, a politics that transcends nation, for an idea of dividing the world into good and bad nations. The second question about the Mitzrahi in Israel. I suspect, well it's my position, and I've argued it possibly more forcefully than I'm actually sure that I believe it, but I think that it's an important position about the Holocaust in terms of 1948. We don't know what would have happened in 48 if the history of Europe had been different between 1933 and 1948. We don't know. It seems to me unlikely that there would have been the declaration of state. It seems to me that there are lots and lots of utopian nationalist movements and other kinds of utopian movements that haven't had the success that Israel has had. And it seems to me that this is hugely to do with what happened in Europe in that period. Um, the coming to Israel of the Mitzrahi happened later, and I think it's related. In fact, I think that there's very, very interesting work, in fact a colleague of mine is doing very, very interesting work on the Middle East. The Middle East during colonial times was full of a number of very, very interesting, very, very lively, very, very cosmopolitan cities. Jerusalem, Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, Beirut. And it's interesting that the force in general which defeated colonialism was nationalism. And one of the byproducts of that is a kind of force towards homogeneity. So colonialism created these huge and rich mixtures of cities. I mean, as well as creating all sorts of other much less pleasant things. And the force which defeated colonialism was nationalism. And nationalism has had a tendency towards homogenization. And it seems, so in that context, it's very interesting that Jews were forced out of these interesting cosmopolitan cities under nationalist regimes, um, or at least largely Arab nationalist, or regimes which t drew from a kind of Stalinist communism as well as a nationalist tradition. Um, and in a sense, Jerusalem was the last city to come under pressure to lose its cosmopolitan identity. Um, so I think that's interesting work, and I think that... Well, I don't know if that's answered the question, but yeah. <laughs> I'll stop. Um, I, I agree with your uh, characterization of uh, your quotations to, of Maasai. And they're dangerous, this kind of anti-Zionism. Anti I'm puzzled why you place the adjective left in front of this type of anti-Zionism. <clears throat> what I know of, design, of the uh, left movements, of socialists, of communists, or progressives, it has nothing to do with, uh, with Assad's type of argument against Israel. There's the argument that I see from the left is a critique of the Israeli government's occupation of its policy towards the Palestinian people, of its desire or effort to quash a Palestinian state from emerging. This is entirely different from the kind of thing 
that Mossad is putting forth. And I think that you're, uh, you know, you have to, I get the impression you're more interested in binding the left than binding the, the you know, or like the, uh, to, to, to equate the two. I think the two are entirely dissimilar. If you go in, in your own country, people like uh, Tony Benn and, uh, or Fisk from The Guardian, these are, these are uh, left anti, these are left people who are critics of the Israeli policy. Israeli policy, and it's, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a disservice to mix them up with uh, guys like Mossad. I'm very <coughs> tempted by an idea which would say, as I kind of said in answer to the question on Marx, would, uh, an answer which would say, the left anti-Zionism, the, the left anti-Zionists in general are not authentically on the left. <laughs> I'm tempted by that argument. It raises problems about how we define left authenticity. I mean, Tony Benn, who you mentioned, for example, has just signed a petition for the release of Tariq Aziz from American custody or Iraqi custody, and he signed it alongside a whole long list of third campists, uh, French fascists, um, lots and lots of sort of very unpleasant Stalinists. And Tony Benn is a very interesting guy. I mean, 20 years ago, Tony Benn was the leader of the left in Britain, <laughs> the leader of the mainstream left in Britain, and, you know, he was our kind of big guy. Um, today, Tony Benn is lining up with a very large number of very unsavoury people in order to have his friend... Tarek Aziz released from prison. I think, I don't want to get lost in semantics, okay? I don't want to start saying this is really the left and that's authentically the left. And I think I'm with you pretty well 90% of the, set of the way in the sense that, that I'm not critiquing left anti-Zionism as, as an attack on the left. I'm critiquing it from the left. I'm, I'm critiquing it because it's my family. <laughs> my family is the left and I don't want this dirty anti-Zionist politics to be polluting it. Um, so I think I agree with a lot of what you, a lot of what you say, actually. Yeah. I, I have a question along similar lines, but um, I would put the point a little differently. Um, if one's dealing with Marx's interpretation of the Jewish question, there's a whole world of ideas that one, a whole constellation of of, um, of traditions even that one would want to bring to bear to that, not least the Enlightenment uh, conception of assimilation, even Voltaire's tradition, he's also accused of anti-Semitism, and Moses Hess would have to figure in this context. Uh, these are figures entirely known to you. One thing I would have thought, um, following from what you said, uh, that, uh, that disposes of that whole tradition is indeed the Holocaust, because um, uh, just in the same sense that the First World War disabused the international working class movement of the hope that somehow there would be a cosmopolitan movement across the nations. So too did the Holocaust disabuse many of the assimilationist figures on the left of the idea that somehow uh, there would be universal rights that Jews would share and, and they would not have these problems. So to some extent one would have said that the Holocaust trumps uh, the Marxist reading in many ways and I think a lot of, a lot of figures on the left would be persuaded by that. And insofar as Marxism itself is suffering now its own difficulties because of the collapse of communism, it does seem to me that the debate has shifted into other areas. And what I would like you to perhaps address more than that long tradition and the problem um, uh, of Marxism and the left in the face of the Holocaust is, is indeed the, uh, the way in which different kinds of anti-Zionism and indeed anti-Semitism have arisen in the left on the left um, after 1967, but even more recently, perhaps after the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Iraq war, because there's a, there's a whole perception, it seems to me, particularly in Europe, it's hard to see from here some, sometimes, but uh, uh, of a sense of the, the, the Israel being the beneficiary of these mad policies that have estranged, as it were, uh, Western civilization from Islam and so forth and that uh, the contamination that uh, some of the left now sees, and it's not a Marxist left, it has other pedigrees, it seems to me, is, 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 is of Israeli complicity, as it's thought, in, 
in, in, in this American uh, imperial escapade and so forth. So I'm, I'm curious to know how you, how, you, how you react to that, because it does seem to me that it, it's of more recent origin, and it, it doesn't carry the baggage, as I see it, of the, of, of the Marxist and communist reading <coughs> of that tradition. I think that out of the Holocaust came two parallel and perhaps in some senses opposite responses that I think are very, very important. One was Zionism, one was nationalism, which said we can't live, Jews can't live any longer in this way. The only way Jews can continue to exist is by self-defense, is through national self-determination. The other response, which occurred at exactly the same time, and in fact not in opposition to that, was the beginning of what I would call cosmopolitan law. So we had the Nuremberg Tribunals, for example, which said that, which in fact was implicitly a critique of nationhood. It said that we're not interested in German or, or Nazi national self-determination or national law because there are international norms and laws which trump that. And the Nuremberg Tribunal said very clearly, I think, that crimes against humanity, <coughs> which was first tried at Nuremberg, are not a crime against a particular people and are not a crime committed within a jurisdiction of a particular state, but are the business of humanity as a whole and will continue to be so. So even out of the Holocaust, kept those two traditions, I think, came strengthened and in parallel. And, uh, well, I wrote my book about one of them. So <laughs> I think the cosmopolitan law tradition, I think, is very, very interesting, very, very important. And I think it was also a direct response to the Holocaust. In terms of... Israel being the beneficiary of 9-11 and the rest. Of course, there's a current in the kind of anti-Zionism that I'm talking about, which already claims that Zionism is a beneficiary of Nazism, of the Holocaust. And you get all sorts of very, very unpleasant arguments around that. For example, Jim Allen wrote a play in the 1980s saying that there was Zionist complicity with the Holocaust, which had the aim of allowing some Jews to escape to Palestine while other Jews went to the ovens. And that's combined with an argument about the ideological similarity between Nazism and Zionism, that both are racial superiority movements, and in fact they're very similar, which leads into all this Zionism equals Nazism stuff. Joseph Mossad's take on it is also very odd because he says that anyone in the Arab world who's a Holocaust denier is actually a Zionist. And his logic there is that he says that Zionism relies on the Holocaust for its justification. And if you deny the Holocaust, then you're accepting that Zionist need to rely on the Holocaust for justification. So Holocaust denial is Zionism. Lots of that stuff. And of course, yes, um, we have... I had a student, actually, who mentioned, I'm not sure that it was Muslims or fundamentalists or any such thing that destroyed the Twin Towers. And so I said, well, well why not? She said, I just don't think so. And I said, well, this is a sociology class, let's have your evidence, your reasons. I don't know, it's just what I think. And we all know there's a lot of that about. I was quite surprised to find it in my own seminar. Um, and the stuff about the Jews were warned <laughs> before 9-11 and, and all these stories. Um, yes, I mean, what can I say? Um, I think... <coughs> I think that there is, you see, I don't think that a lot of this anti-Zionism is motivated by anti-Semitism. I don't think that people like Massad or Sue Blackwell 
this picture I put up there, are people who hate Jews and who therefore set about and find a really sneaky way of with an idea that the United States is actually the only evil on the planet. The only evil because all other evils are created by or blown back from the United States. So that Bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, for example, um, anybody else you care to mention, um, the Janjaweed in Sudan, are all creatures of the CIA, and if they're not creatures of the CIA, are cr uh, created by imperialism. So, the only real force for evil in the world, on the planet, is the United States, and Israel has a particular relationship to the United States. And sometimes that relationship is painted as being one of, um, the of Israel as the watchdog or the thing of the United States in the Middle East, and sometimes it's the other way around, that the United States is in fact under the control of Israel. Um, I've always thought the watchdog thing was very odd, because when the United States wants to go and assert its power in the Middle East, it can't use Israel. Israel is completely useless to the United States. And when the United States wants to invade Iraq, it has to use Saudi Arabia, and it has to use Turkey, and it has to use all sorts of places, and the one place it can't use is Israel. Um, so I think that we start with politics. And I think you're right that it, it is actually a kind of different tradition from the Marxist tradition, I think. Although I happen to think that it has a lot in common with a kind of Stalinist tradition of what you might want to call Marxism. Um, that, so I think that the politics comes first, and the particular position in the world of Israel, and therefore Jews, comes second. So people develop, people who think of themselves as anti-racist develop a worldview which puts Israel and Jews right at the centre. And as I said, I think there's an interesting analogy with the way that Jews were put right at the centre of global capital. And I think both ideas, of course, <laughs> have nothing to do with an authentic land. Okay, you, you actually partially answered what my question was going to be, which, which was more about wealth of emphasis. You know, there, there's a whole range of issues on the left. If, if you were, in some sense, going to take a poll of people who identify with the left uh, about uh, issues which, which are troubling, in a sense, one has is, is that uh, the issue of, of Israel and Zionism would, would rank really highly. And so there's two questions, basically, which is if, in fact, that supposition is true, question is why. Uh, why? Why is this so different from all other issues that would concern the left? Uh, on the other hand, it's possible that maybe maybe we're misperceiving. Uh, you know, it could be that that uh, actually it's overreported. It could be that it, it sells well. It it, it it kind of makes for good discussion. But if you actually were to somehow or another talk to uh, again get a representative view on the left, it, it maybe isn't the most important thing. Maybe it's the fifth most important thing. So I'm just curious to know what what your take is on on that. Well, it's a very, very important question, isn't it? Why is there so much noise about the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, which has resulted in the death of something like four or 5,000 Palestinians, both civilians and combatants, within the last five years, and also a number of Israelis? Why is everybody so interested in that and not apparently in the least interested in the current genocide that's going on as we speak in Darfur, where a conservative estimate says that 200,000 people have been killed, there has been rape on a huge scale and ethnic cleansing on a huger scale. So why? How do we explain this? <laughs> it's difficult to explain. You see, my... my Instinct is, is before, as I say, we start with politics and it leads to a very odd and rather foolish position that puts Israel central. I want to show you a picture. I don't know if people, people can't see that very well. <laughs> 
At the top it says boycott Israeli goods. And this is a Jaffa orange. And this is blood. And it says, don't squeeze a Jaffa, crush the occupation. Now, we have a coincidence here of three things. Jews, food and blood. Now, I suspect that everybody in this room understands very well the significance of that combination. How did this picture get, how did this poster get designed? It's a very powerful poster, it's more powerful in colour. <laughs> how did this poster get designed? And there's only three things that I can think of, and all of them seem entirely far-fetched to me. One, it's a complete coincidence. Jews, food, blood, wow, well, could happen to anybody. I don't buy that. Two, the artist was consciously drawing on the visual <coughs> rhetoric of the blood libel. I don't buy that either, actually. I don't think that these kinds of posters are made by conscious anti-Semites. So the third possibility feels much too union <laughs> for my liking. And the third possibility is that there's some kind of way in which the artist knew that this would be a really powerful image. And he didn't know why. I don't know, I don't know if people can tell me which one of the three. Um, you know, is that it is alright to ascribe malevolence when malevolence is almost clear by the evidence. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, don't, be, don't feel guilty about using that word. In your paper, you spent some time um, developing the events at Durban, as I recall. Um, we, I, no. thought, I, thought I, on, I thought I read that. And I, I wondered whether, I, I thought I had your name related to it in a nice way. Uh, I thought, I <laughs> Go thought, on then. I, I, thought, <laughs> Take credit for it. I walk away with the, with <coughs> the, Dur the Durban events and its um, uh, capturing of anti-Semitism and, and using it for what I walked away with and many people walked away with a very clear focus on anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli matters. So there was no intellectualization to me about the use of anti-Zionism in, in the Durban meetings. Could you comment on that meeting and on that juxtaposition of the use of anti-Semitism for that purpose in context of anti-Semitism as used today? In reality, not as a long-standing, historically intellectual lifeline. Right. I'm not an expert yet on all of the anti-Zionisms. I know about left anti-Zionism. I've just been running a campaign against it, and I'm from that milieu, which, in fact, we were running campaigns against it 20 years ago on campus too. One of the things that I said in my paper that I think is very important is that anti-Zionism is increasingly, and I was quite surprised to discover this, and I've discovered it recently, and I think it's true. I think that all anti-Semitism comes in the form of anti-Zionism at the moment. That might not be 100% true, but I think that all important manifestations of anti-Semitism use anti-Zionist rhetoric. So skinheads in Berlin at the moment are suddenly affecting a great concern for Palestinian rights. People like David Irving and David Duke are... David Irving's website links to Robert Fisk and to all these people in order to draw on the anti-Zionist argument. Also, the connection between Israel, Jews, and the war against terror. So, for example, we have um, people like George Galloway in the UK who are coming to the United States and doing radio broadcasts with crazy right-wing radio stations and getting on very nicely. Um, and I can't remember how I got there. Yes, th there's a whole bunch of different anti-Zionisms. And I think that in terms of the left, I think there's a real issue of political responsibility because the ideas that come out can go anywhere. So, and I also, I don't know 
a huge amount about Durban, but it seems to me that Durban was a place where a number of these different anti-Zionist critiques came together. And the one which considers itself to be anti-racist just got lost and fell into a number of the others. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, as you just said, I think talking about um, anti-Zionism rather than anti-Zionism is, is empirically perilous and, and unwise, and it's tempting to fall into that trap. Um, but it, what happens when you, you do that is you, you, you fail to define an ontological relationship between anti-Zionism and an anti-Semitism. And this question of political responsibility, that seems to, to be where the two kind of um, con connected for you. but And you were starting to do this in your last answer, but I wonder if you could really distill what characteristics make a particular form of anti-Zionism um, anti-Semitic, because otherwise you, you have what's essentially a deductive enterprise. It's sort of like, okay, well, Mossad and Finkelstein, they're anti-Semites, so th and then we look at, at what they're saying. Uh, and then you don't leave room for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think... Actually, I think this work comes out of the practical experience of being involved in a campaign over the last year. And I don't know how much, if people know the story of the boycott campaign, which I won't go into in any great depth. Um, in my judgment, it wasn't organised by anti Semites. It was organised by people who considered themselves to be anti racists and who said and understood themselves not to be anti Semites. It did create an anti-Semitic movement, and it had my union adopt an anti-Semitic policy for a month or two. So how does this how does this happen? Now, as I say, you say to the anti-Zionists, "This is an anti-Semitic policy in my union." They say, "How dare you call me an anti-Semite?" I'm not motivated by hatred of Jews. And I think they believe that. Interestingly, I mean, one of the ways we've done that is by making an analogy with institutional racism. Because this was also a big issue in Britain over the last few years. There was a, I don't know if people know about the killing of Stephen Lawrence. He was a black teenager who was murdered by white racists in southeast London. <clears throat> and the police completely bungled the investigation. And the reason they did that was because they immediately suspected Stephen Lawrence's friend of being a murderer, and Stephen Lawrence's friend was also black. Now, this went on for a long time, the political campaign. Eventually, there was a public inquiry, and a judge delivered his verdict. He said, there is a problem of institutional racism in the Metropolitan Police in London. And there was a big debate about that, so everybody understood what this might mean. The idea that there are racist practices in the Metropolitan Police, which are not necessarily motivated by racism on the part of individual police officers. Now, everybody understood this because there was a debate about it in Britain. The only people who didn't understand it were the Police Federation, which is the kind of trade union who represent police officers, and they said, How dare you? How dare you say that our members are racist? And everybody else said, ah, you don't understand what's being discussed here. In this instance, if you say that there is a problem of institutional anti-Semitism on the left, if you say that some currents on the left are creating not racist practices, but racist narratives and racist politics and racist policies, but that this is not the result of conscious anti-Semitism, but it is the result of the interaction between a certain set of ideas and a social movement, then these sophisticated anti-racists will throw up their hands in an exact mirror image of the Police Federation rep and say, how dare you call us anti-Semites, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and I think that's actually quite a good analogy and it's quite a good way into thinking it through because I think that this is not a conscious Jew hatred and it's not motivated. It's not motivated by a conscious Jew hatred, but I think that it does create an anti-Semitic movement, and I think once you create an anti-Semitic movement, you then license anti-Semitism, 
You, you create a movement where various ways of thinking become okay. You create a movement eventually where somebody is going to be sharp enough to understand the power of the potentiality of what could be achieved with this movement. And I suspect it's going to sweep away all these nice anti-racist, anti-Zionists with a flick of a finger. We recognize each other. You. Um, I want to disagree with you. Um, I, you know, I understand the intellectual approach and what you're engaged in and what you're doing, and I admire it greatly, and I think your presentation is great. But I'd like to start. I feel we should start. You mentioned start with they start with politics. Uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, politics uh, and propaganda and what a series of laws that can come out of political action, such as the Nuremberg Laws, lead somewhere. In other words, politics itself depends on what kind of politics we're talking about. But the politics I think they're talking about is bad for the Jews, let's put it that way. Uh, you also <laughs> talked about uh, actuality. Uh, my feeling is that Israel is a, is a state that's an, is a member of the United Nations. That's an actuality. If they, if, if they argue that Israel is not a state, uh, that's not rational. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just not intellectual behavior, I think. Uh, it, you know, it could be an academic discussion, fine. We can always have that. Uh, so I would like to suggest that the premise might be that that a vocal anti-Zionist uh, uh, is uh, is anti-Israel and is anti-Jewish. And if that's not the case, let 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 them uh, show the proof that that's the case, rather than the other way around. You seem to give them more the benefit of the doubt. I don't. <laughs> I think that the important thing is that people who are on the left... You see, you might be right about some of them, but I don't know what goes on in their heads. I don't know what motivates them. I've got no idea. I know that most people on the left are not motivated by anti-Semitism. And many of them are still susceptible to the argument produced by the anti-Zionists. And... I quite agree with you, it creates a politics that's both Jews. It creates an anti-Semitic politics, it creates an institutional anti-Semitism of the left. I think that's absolutely right. Although it's not only on the left that this process occurs. Um, I think that what the argument that we need to win in the left is that we need to be conscious and careful of the boundary between demonization and legitimate criticism. And I think that not only are a number of people not conscious of that boundary, but they deny that it exists. And by the same token, I think we need to hold that boundary, we need to hold that space open, the space for legitimate criticism. Because I suspect that there are people on the Israeli and Jewish right who would like to close that space off. And so I'm in that space trying to hold it against the left who say, uh, there's no space there, and the right who says all criticism is submitted, anti-Semitic, and I think we need to hold that space of reasonable political criticism open. So, first here from Paul, and then maybe I'll collect a bunch of questions. Isn't there a bit of circular reasoning here? Not on your part, on their part. Israel, Israel being perceived as part of a Western hegemony, uh, you use the phrase that the Jews were spat out of Europe, which is self-evident. They were also spat out of the Arab lands, moved to Israel. Logic, rationality, would show the benefits of economic cooperation of, within all the, among all the Middle Eastern nations, including Israel, 
They will have none of it. Israel then turns to the West, where it has very good trade and cultural relations, despite anti-Semitism, anti-Israel attitudes, and so forth. And then they say, well, now you see, they're part of the West. They created the very situation they're complaining about. And you give them a lot of credit for intellectual capacity, and I don't see any common sense in any of this. <laughs> and therefore, I tend to agree with, with, with Bert. It smells to me like anti-Semitism. I don't see much common sense in it either, but when you're a Jewish student on campus and somebody's shouting at you, you're a Zionist, you're a racist, you support this law in Israel, you support the occupation, you support the bulldozing of peace activists, you support the... the, the it's actually... Well, it kind of feels like it makes more sense than it does, and it feels to the people watching like that, and I think it's something that we need to be able to take on in a kind of serious way. I mean, a part of what I'm interested in doing is... And that's part of what we did in this campaign, was by giving people facts and arguments with which they could take on these kinds of, as you say, actually rather ridiculous arguments, but they look quite good sometimes. The great example of the funding thing, sorry, of the looking to the West thing, is that one of the demands of the boycott movement, or parts of the boycott movement, or in fact the more reasonable wing of the boycott movement, is to say, Israel shouldn't get any benefit from European Union money for research in universities. That Israel gets a particular, I don't even know what the deal is, but they say Israel gets a particular deal with the European Union, and it certainly shouldn't get this special treatment. Now, of course, the, re the, the, the reality is that, of course, Israel should be part of the Middle Eastern academic milieu. Of course it should. It should get funding you know, from Saudi Arabia and from Lebanon and from Jordan and from Iraq. Sure. Great. This is impossible. So Israel goes to Europe and then the Europeans say, ah, it's, uh, um, you're giving them a benefit that you don't give everybody else. And this goes from tragedy to farce when you get people saying they should be kicked out of the Eurovision Song Contest. I don't know. People don't know what the Eurovision Song Contest is. It's a kind of television program where all the countries in Europe sing a song. Worst song. That's how Abba got famous from the Eurovision Song Contest. And Israel won it a few times, yes, annoyingly, to, to the anti -Zionists. And uh, in fact, the country that was thrown out of the Eurovision Song Contest last year was Lebanon. And the reason for that was because their television company refused to show the Israeli song. So it's kind of huge Europe-wide television thing. And in Lebanon, the screen goes shh for three minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm coming back. I want to thank you for your uh, your analysis, and I'm coming back. I want to push you. This may not be fair uh, uh, to reflect on precisely what kind of anti-Zionism actually slides into anti-Semitism. Uh, I know you're, you're suggesting that uh, much of leftist anti-Zionism actually creates a climate in which normalizes anti-Semitism. Am I understanding that? Kind um, of. Yeah. Yep. But I'm, I'm wondering if, I, I'm also interested in the space that allows for uh, criticism uh, of Israeli policy. Uh, and I think I think you are absolutely right that the uh, that space is under assault both from the left and from the right. So so I'm asking you to think about precisely what kind of anti-Zionism actually uh, I would use the term descends into anti-Semitism. We can see it happening in a few cases at the moment. Um, generally. If you say to anti-Zionists, look, this is an anti-Semitic politics, they will get on their high horse and they will say, no, we're against Zionism, which is this political movement, we're not against Jews. And they will say some of our best <laughs> members are, are Jews, and it's true, interestingly. There is a new current, <laughs> or a small current of people, when you say 
You're not against Zionists. You're against Jews. They'll say, yeah, all right then. We're against Jews. One of them is a guy called Gilad Atzmon, who is a well-known saxophonist and Holocaust denier. He's a jazz sax guy from Israel who calls himself now, he says, I'm not Jewish, I've rejected my Judaism as well as my Zionism. And Asmon runs around with a guy called Israel Shamir, who is a Holocaust denier and an anti-Zionist, and a guy called Paul Eisen, who was running a campaign called Dea Yassin Remembered. So it was actually quite a kosher anti-Zionist campaign. Mm -hmm. Turned out it was run by this guy who was an open ex -Semite. Now. We've got a bunch of old-fashioned left anti-Zionists called Jews Against Zionism. And they embody all the kinds of politics that I was talking about. But they also are keen on a rhetoric against anti-Semitism. In fact, their argument, of course, is that Zionism buys into anti-Semitism and encourages anti-Semitism and agrees with anti-Semitism. So when... Gilad Atzman, the Holocaust, the Holocaust denier and saxophonist guy, was invited to a big event in London called Marxism 2005, which is organised by one of the big political parties that claims to be Marxist. These Jews against Zionism went and protested. So you had these anti-Zionist people who had a real, an actual politics of anti-Semitism suddenly got worried. And the reason they suddenly got worried was because there were people who were arguing openly anti-Semitic things, and they were being invited to mainstream anti-Zionist events. And as I say, I think that, I suspect we're going to see more of this. And there's another angle on that, which is that the same party that organised this Marxism event, called the SWP, is also organising within what's called the Respect Coalition with George Galloway, and they are organising in Muslim communities. Now, I'm in favour of the left organising in Muslim communities. I think we should do more of that. But the basis on which they organise in the Muslim communities is firstly around anti-Zionism, so hatred of Israel, and they've done it in a number of places against Jewish MPs. And secondly, um, without challenging any of the tenets of jihadi fundamentalism. So, one, we can see these new openly anti-Semitic guys appearing. Two, there are now alliances being made which are actually something that's quite new. Um, so I think things are moving in a difficult direction. I think we have like 10 minutes left, so I was thinking maybe we can collect a bunch of questions. So That's good, because I can choose what I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned a number of times that you see an institutionalized anti-Semitism developing out of the anti-Zionist um, rhetoric and uh, philosophy that is not necessarily motivated by anti-Semitism. And you've mentioned that you've been fighting against this. I would like to hear more about what you've done specifically to address those problems and how effective the different strategies are, how, how you're trying to solve this as an issue within the organizations that you're involved with. Yeah. Let's assume that we accept the fact that uh, anti-Zionism is uh, mainly because of the suffering of the Palestinians. Do you know anything about um, how many, let's say in comparison, how many uh, events uh, are uh, anti-Zionist related events um, in Europe in a, you know in in any year compared to let's say events that are you know uh, looking at the uh, Tibet China issue or um, you know Sudan like it was mentioned earlier that I myself I don't feel that you actually answer here uh, do you think the same Israeli-Palestinian conflict is getting a, a fair a view or fair judgment by the left here, or it is getting too much attention? Uh, you spoke about the difference between legitimate protests and demonization, which I do tend to believe in. However, 
the question is where do you draw that line? I'm curious if you can give concrete examples because, for example, the ad, the ad that you should about that vestment, where does that fall? Would you have protest or that vestment? Because I think a lot of people cleaning out in this room would believe that's legitimate protest. So I'm curious if you can give concrete examples of the difference. Anybody else? More, I guess more of a comment than a question, but it's one, one step towards Paula's uh, issue about, about you know, when, when do you cross the line? I mean, if you want to take a look at legitimate criticism, you don't have to go any further than Israel itself. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at the different political parties, you look at the fact that the uh, person who has just taken over the Labor Party is the leader of the largest trade union in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to hear how people on the left accuse a leader of a trade union, the largest trade union, who probably is arguing for a, I mean, his, his ideal economic policy would be further to the left than probably any country in Europe at this point. Uh, my guess is that they're still not going to like him anyway, regardless of what happens to him in the future. So I, I, I just think that there's sort of a useful benchmark there, that uh, you know, you, you, you have vibrant discussion and debate of, about issues, as opposed to, as uh, I think David did argue well, homogenization, a view that says Israel is just all the same. It doesn't matter who's in charge, and it doesn't matter you know, who does not. So I think that's actually a useful way to think about it. Just look at, look at what's happening in Israel itself, and, and you'll see plenty of examples of criticism that wouldn't be considered oh. anti-Semitic. <clears throat> Trying to get back at the question of where is legitimate criticism and, and where it might even be legitimate anti-Zionist uh, arguments as opposed to anti-Semitic. Uh, I wonder, uh, uh, not necessarily to defend the, the argument, but to put forth where it would come from uh, and get your reaction to it, is uh, the question of what happened to the Arab lands after World War I and what's happened ever since then. And uh, uh, seeing that, generally speaking, the uh, West, uh, meaning Europe and the United States, have uh, in many ways uh, been against dem democracy emerging in the Arab states and that have overthrown them, uh, you know, for example, the Iranian regime, to pick one example, and have interfered generally in the Middle East in an imperialist way or a neo-colonialist way. And so I think oftentimes uh, the uh, European and American, through the UN, support for Israel is seen in that larger context of, of uh, you know, the lack of a real Arab uh, 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 cohesion and recovery from maybe uh, uh, World War One. So, just to throw that out. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, the um, website is up there, and I think that's the best way I can answer your question. Actually, is, which is the question of what kind of things are we doing? is actually to refer people to the website and ask them to have a look. The website came out of the campaign against the boycott in academia. <clears throat> and we understood it as being a place where we could give people who either weren't sure or were against the boycott facts and arguments and discussions and, and uh, something to go out and fight with. So I think... That's one of the things we're doing, and I, I would refer people to. I hope everybody goes and has a look at the website, and I hope they like it and come back often. Um, I think that on the left, there is much, much, much more noise about Israel Palestine than there is about Tibet or China or Sudan or any of the other things that we might think are actually greater <coughs> human rights abuses. Um, I think that's very clear. And I think that. Perhaps to come back to, to, to your point and possibly some others, you see, I think that the situation in Palestine is pretty bad. All right? There are 300 checkpoints which regulate where Palestinians are allowed to go. In terms of the academic debate, there are real problems at Bezite University. Bezite is closed down by the Israeli army every now and then. It's very, very difficult to get to work and to get from work, let alone to attend a conference somewhere else, you might need six hours to get to university or you might need six minutes because you don't know how long you will be held up at the checkpoints between your house and your students and where they study. So organising a university in such conditions is very, very difficult and life in such conditions is very, very difficult. In Britain, 
the last demonstration that the Palestine Solidarity Campaign held was very, very small. So there's a lot of noise by a few people on the left, but their work is entirely ineffective. And the reason their work is entirely ineffective is because everybody knows that they smell of anti-Semitism. Okay? That they peddle a politics which people are not comfortable with. So it's a very noisy but a very small movement. And what we need is a very noisy and a very big movement, I think, which does two things. It links with Palestinians and it campaigns for a democratic Palestine. And two, it links with the Israeli peace movement and it encouraged the Israeli peace movement and it encouraged